second reading today is from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 17, verses 11 through 19. On the way to Jerusalem, he was passing along between Samaria and Galilee. And as he entered a village, he was met by ten lepers who stood at a distance, lifted up their voices, and said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. When he saw them, he said to them, Go and show yourselves to the priests. And as they went, they were cleansed. Then one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back, praising God with a loud voice. And he fell on his face at Jesus' feet, giving him thanks. Now he was a Samaritan. Then said Jesus, Were not ten cleansed? Where are the nine? Was no one found to return and give praise to God except this foreigner? And he said to him, Rise and go your way. Your faith has made you well. May God add his blessings to his words. So in this month of October, um, we are going to start looking at um, our giving and, and what that means for us and our own spiritual growth. Um, however, comma, before we jump into that, um, I wanted to reflect a little bit on what's been happening this week um, and, and the relational piece of why we give and that foundation um, and then in these coming weeks, we'll get into the nuts and bolts of giving and the liberation and the freedom that really does, I promise you, come with giving um, and looking at, at that piece. But for now, I want to start with the relational aspects um, and the why behind this all. Um, last weekend was the installation service of our new bishop, Bishop Luttrell Easterling. And can we have a moment for what a fabulous name, last name that is, to be a bishop, Easterling, one of Easter? It's just fantastic. Um, but she's a new bishop that has just currently um, been elected um, and has come to the Baltimore-Washington Conference to serve us. And her inaugural sermon um, in this installation service was, We Are One was looking at what it means to be one body, one family, one people, what means to, for all of us to be made one in the one spirit, in our one salvation, in the one waters of our baptism. And so as we, as I went from that week and that call and some phenomenal preaching, I can't wait for you all to hear her because she is she is a gift from God, and, and I can't wait to see what happens um, with this conference um, under her leadership. Um, into um, a pretty evil week um, in terms of what's been happening um, on our national stage um, and, and in the world. And it seems that this wrestle with how we treat each other seems to be our human issue for no matter who we are, where we are, or what time period it is. This is just our, our struggle that we can't ever quite seem to get. And whether, whether that is a struggle with um, someone who is different defined on gender or on age or by ethnicity or by capability or about who we love, whatever category we have set up, we always seem to be able to find one and seem to be able to be in this struggle without ever overcoming it. And the scriptures um, from today's lectionary reading um, speak directly to that. Um, so we go to Jeremiah, who is talking with a people, with Israelites, who have been called to be God's chosen people, who have called to follow the Abrahamic covenant of God blessing them in order that God might bless all the families of the earth. Except the problem that Jeremiah was encountering is that that through line of blessing wasn't exactly happening at that time. And so for those most vulnerable in society at that time, it was the widow and the orphan and the foreigner who weren't getting access to this blessing. And it was, there were gates stopping it instead of currents taking it out as, 
as God wanted in the covenant to begin with. And so Jeremiah is there and he's calling the people to change and to realize what they're doing and to come back to the covenant to share that blessing as they have been called to. And he's even doing this on the temple steps and calling the temple itself to accountability with how it's the very place that is supposed to be ushering this current is actually the one building the gates and stopping it. And so this is going on and on and no one's listening and Jeremiah is even imprisoned. And we come to today's or last week's passage where the Babylonians then came and invaded. The temple is destroyed and the people are sent into exile. And this week's lesson is a word from the prophet to those who are in exile, to those who have lost everything and their whole identity, their homes, their families, everything is dispersed and they have no center of who they are anymore. And and what does this mean theologically? Did they get it wrong all these times? Were the Babylonian gods actually greater and more powerful than Yahweh? Or did they sin so egregiously that God has thrown them out forever and that they will never be able um, to repair that relationship or come or come home again? And in the midst of all of this fear and all of this crisis come news from other prophets saying, don't worry, it's all going to be okay. You're going to be able to come back home and God's not going to leave you abandoned and, and this is fine. And then there's the word from Jeremiah that says, yeah, not so much. You're going to be where you are in exile for a while So Mary, have your kids Mary. This is going to be generational. This is not going to be a quick turnaround. And then, after this hard talk and this hard accountability, Jeremiah gives this line of look to the welfare of the city in which you are. And Jeremiah tells the people that that's how they will find their own welfare, their own well-being their own healing. Look to the welfare of those who you could call your enemies that have brought about this crisis. And that's where you're going to find your welfare and your well-being. This is huge. Not just in terms of how we relate to each other and how we are called to see the other and one another, but also for how we understand God. This is the shift of the theology that Jeremiah was railing against at this temple steps. You say you can do anything you want because this is the temple of the Lord. This is the temple of the Lord. Well, our God isn't a territorially localized God. God is universal. And so this is Jeremiah's call to his people to find God where they are. In the other, and to find God caring for the other and working with them and the other, this is their school. This is retraining ground. Remember, I called you to be be blessed so that I could bless others through you. This is practice time to get that back in our body, soul, DNA, to be able to do this and live this once again. And in the midst of this training that's going to take a while because it's hard, the end comes with that favorite verse that, Jan, was it you who shared that when we were sharing our favorite verses? Jeremiah 29, 11, I know the plans I have for you. This is what follows this scripture reading. Look to the welfare of the other, and that is what's going to make this future filled with hope possible. That's what's going to make the return home possible. A return home not to the way things were that caused this problem in the first place, but a return home that is fully healed, that is liberated, in which joy has been found that was once lost. In terms of what we look like and what we'll be talking about in our giving, this is the wilderness and, and of manna, of how God worked with the Israelites after being freed from slavery in Egypt to gather the manna that was enough for them. So that no one had too little, everyone had what they needed, 
but also no one had too much. And that the manna that was hoarded, you all, re you all remember this, right? What happened to the hoarded manna? It went bad. It rotted. Thank you, Pastor Bill. <laughs> all right. Oh, Joel and Melissa back here too. All right. All right. So it is a call to live in a position of trust and faith that there will be enough and that there will be enough even when we share with others and make sure that they have enough. And that's not what we're taught, right? We're taught that there's only so much and we better take care of us and ours because if we don't, somebody else is going to get it and we're not going to have enough. It's a complete reprogramming of who we are and how we understand each other and how we understand the resources that are available to all of us. And this is where we step into the gospel of Luke and the parable of the healing. Once again, we have a reminder that God's healing is available for all. This is Christ universally caring for and bringing about whole life for everyone, no matter what. This similar um, history um, in terms of Samaria and why that's such a big deal is because after the Davidic monarchy, after um, Solomon's death, there was a breaking between the two kingdoms and northern Israel and southern um, Judah. And northern Israel was captured before the Babylonians captured Judah. Northern Israel was captured by the Assyrians. Um, and again, the same resettlement and the same diaspora, because that was the tactic at the time to make sure no one group was in place enough to um, be able to build a revolt or a rebellion. And so while Judah was still all together and, and not occupied, still in control, um, they then called these other tribes of the northern kingdom the lost tribes. They became foreigners. The blood was tainted because it was mixed with the other, with other people. And there was a break and a divide that history just kept, um, you know, making worse and emphasizing in the different events that came along. And so once again, we look to God calling us to think differently about who we classify other and who deserves our care and our attention and our healing. Now, all 10 of those lepers were healed. And so the point of this story isn't what Christ needed, but the type of healing that we have access to, that we have a choice to receive. The nine got their healing and got their life back, and you better believe they're off and running back to family and to who everyone else that they were cut off and away from and had no access to. I think of it in terms of parents. Like my parents got my sister braces and spent the money because she was so embarrassed of her crooked teeth that she wouldn't ever smile or do anything. And and once she got braces and got them straightened out, my parents would always say how much that was worth it just to see her smile again and be confident in that. And it wasn't that my parents needed my sister to fall over herself in thankfulness. They saw the liberation. They saw the life and that element um, that she gained because of that. And so there was that peace. But what happened to the one who came back was a level of healing that the others lost out on. In fact, the last verse that says, you know, um, where Christ tells this one who's already been healed, your faith has made you well, that can be translated in to your faith has saved you. There's a completeness and a wholeness that happens when we're able to step into that next step of gratitude and gratefulness. It's kind of like that next step in the discipleship journey from coming on Sunday worship and being gathered together and how wonderful and warm that is, but then joining a small group and finding out the depth of what it means to be known, for people to know your struggles and how it is with your soul and to know that you are not alone in them and that there are people that you can call that will drop anything to come and to be with you and whatever you need, whether that be a crisis or a celebration, like, oh my gosh, this happened and it's phenomenal. 
this is what I want for us as a church, and this is what I want for us as a nation and as a country. This is the one thing that I will say about the election that we have coming up and that the choice we have to make. We are citizens, not only of this country, but of the kingdom of God. And as such, I would hope that it is that kingdom citizenship that calls us and informs us as to how we live out this citizenship. And what I personally want is the teachings of Jeremiah and of Christ, of the universal availability of God's love and God's care to infiltrate the way that we relate to one another and do governance together. I'm terrified of the way that we have set up the other divide of one party versus the other. It breaks me <laughs> to see us make enemies of each other when we are all trying to care for and empower and bring health and well-being to the same cities in the same country. And we each have a vote that others have died winning for us to be able to use these values and these hopes that are informed by who we know God to be and who we know us to be as followers of Christ. And I want that to be present in our conversation. And I want to be able to build a, a dynamic and a way of doing governance together that recognizes strengths and limitations, that does accountability, but that above all works with. This obsession of standing our ground and shutting governments down and, and, and throwing anyone under the bus that we can just to prove our point is going to destroy us. And what I want for us is to be able to get out of this crazy and to find a different way forward. And we have a vote that will do that. And for the first time in seven years, I get to vote in the House and the Congress and not just for the Oval Office. And I'm really excited about that. Um, but it's more. It's how we each practice seeing the other and how we set up the dynamics and the interactions that will then inform and affect the way that our leaders feel that they can approach and govern. Because one pressures the other, and we can use our power for good, or we can escape and continue to let things fall apart, or even worse, foment all of this. So a prayer for healing. A prayer for a way for us to be able to take a deep breath and that even if we are right, as my driving instructor would tell me at 16 years of age, there's a difference between being right and being dead right. And can there be a way for us to take the truth and the rightness that we believe so passionately in, but work with that with one another in a way that doesn't leave our country and our cities dead. There is a calling to begin all of this in gratefulness, that when we are able to accept the truth that God is available for all, for every single other that we don't think deserves it, and when we can not only accept that truth, but find liberation in it, then we find our salvation. Then we find our completeness. And then, as our call to worship say, we find the surprise in one another who brings a dynamic and a level and a joy and a truth to life that surprises us and enriches us. And I'm tired of missing out on that. I don't want to anymore. 
So I would ask that you all partner together as the Epworth family and that together we begin to set a different dynamic and to witness a different way of relating to each other. And that we begin that in gratitude as our foundation so that then our giving and what we do in the city can come from this foundation because Lord knows there's enough falling apart right now to have us lose hope and wonder why we even have the gospel and the church surviving all of this in the first place but we start together with gratefulness. So if as families you could promise to make the following commitment in this coming week and make this a regular practice that you close every day naming what you are grateful for. And I would ask that specifically if there is a group of other that you are really having a hard time understanding and that is just completely making you cranky, that you pick one thing, one thing, from there that you are grateful for and that you build that because we've got to retrain the way we relate to each other we've got to retrain the way we see each other and we've got to retrain what we are open to and then with that openness with that foundation we will watch God build the future of hope and of prosperity that God has for us, for our cities, and for our country.